It's now my distinct honor to introduce my friend and this year's keynote speaker. One of the world's only surgeons who is trained as both a plastic surgeon and reconstructive urologist with fellowship training in transgender surgery. Please welcome to the stage the one and only Dr. Curtis Crane. That's the plan. <laughs> I, I'm told that if you're giving a speech and you're a little nervous, you should picture your audience naked. But I've reconstructed some of the genitalia out there. So whoever came up with that probably didn't envision this exact scenario. <laughs> we should, thank you. We should probably start. All right. My name is Curtis Crane, and I'm both a board-certified plastic surgeon and fellowship-trained reconstructive urologist. I'm the owner of one of the largest volume practices in the world that's dedicated to serving the transgender community. That feels good, thank you. We have practice locations here in Austin and one in San Francisco comprised of six surgeons, and together, we help more than a thousand brave individuals every year become the people they were always meant to be. It is my distinct honor to be your keynote speaker here tonight and share some of my thoughts with you. But when you're asked to be a keynote speaker, it puts a little pressure on you to come up with something profound or compelling that your audience can go off into the night and ponder. And the problem is I am not someone with profound or compelling thoughts. I think about two things all day long, reconstructing genitalia and ping pong. One of these is really complicated with exceptionally narrow margins for error. that takes years of training to become proficient at that only few in the world have mastered. And the other is quite the opposite. I'm not gonna tell you which is which, but because I'm not someone with profound or compelling thoughts, I figured tonight I would talk to you about history because history is easy to talk about because it's already happened. All I have to do is tell you where we are and how I think we got here. Because this is a pretty impressive thing we have here tonight. All of us coming together to support and celebrate one of the most important causes, equality. Arguably, climate change is also pretty important, unless you've come to the realization that the Earth is probably past its point of no return and it's warming, in which case we can at least come together and wreak havoc on this planet and warm it together as equals. <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> equality in history go hand in hand, unfortunately, because our history has been riddled with inequalities, be it because of religious persecution or oppression because of ethnicity, gender, even species. A 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens weren't the only humans on the planet. There were also Neanderthals, but they were tall and they were funny looking and they weren't very good conversationalists, so the Homo sapiens wiped them out. That was probably one of the first examples of inequality in the human race. 100,000 years is a lot of history to cover in 15 minutes. So I would figure I'd maybe just focus on the last 100 years and particularly focus on the community I serve, the transgender community. So I'd like you all to imagine a time about 100 years ago, a trans man, and that is someone that's born with female genitalia, but with the identity of male. And I'm only using this as a hypothetical situation to illustrate a point as a commentary on how we view gender incongruence today. So there's a trans man and he goes to a doctor's office and this is a very well-meaning doctor and the doctors haven't always been well-meaning, but we'll give this doctor 
the benefit of the doubt in this hypothetical scenario. And so we'll call this doctor, Dr. Civil Rights. So a trans man goes to Dr. Civil Rights office and says, I have gender incongruence. Dr. Civil Rights says, well, tell me about that. That's very interesting. And this trans man says, well, my gender identity, which is how I subjectively feel in my head as male or female, does not align with my body. This is a really articulate patient. So Dr. Civil Rights says, I think we have two options. Option one, let's educate society. Let's let society know that XX is not always female and XY is not always male. And that, yeah. And that humans aren't even the only animals that display occasional incongruence. And there are plants that oscillate back and forth between sexes, depending on environmental stressors. And that if you look back over recorded history, there are numerous examples of gender incongruence across various cultures, civilizations on every continent and leave it to human, leave it to humans after 4 billion years of evolution to finally recognize nature's norm. And if we could teach that to society, then in this hypothetical situation, this very well-meaning accepted society would say, thank you so much for the education patient and Dr. Civil Rights. Now we know about the trans community. And now we understand there's a few million in the US alone that are in the trans community and we're ready to accept them with open arms and embrace them. And I think if that hypothetical situation happened a hundred years ago, maybe there's some patients seeking out surgery today that wouldn't need it. They would just say, hey, I'm accepted as a trans man or woman. And that would be good enough. Maybe some still would, but maybe some wouldn't. So that's option one, educate society. The other option, Dr. Civil Rights says, is option two. We could reconstruct you so that you fit society's narrative of what you should be as a man. And what we can do is we can harvest a flap of skin from your forearm. And we'll bring with that flap the deep and superficial venous drainage system of the flap and forearm. We're also gonna bring the radial artery, giving the flap a blood supply. We're gonna take the medial and lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerves because everyone wants sensation in their genitalia. We're gonna de-epithelialize the strip and roll that over, creating a urethra inside the flap. Then we're gonna wrap the other edge of the skin around so that the phallus has skin on the outside. It's also very important. And then we're gonna go to the tip of the phallus and we're gonna make a circumferential incision all the way around and raise a flap and roll it underneath so that it will have a glands. While we're there, we're gonna do a hysterectomy, a vaginectomy. We're gonna raise labia majora flaps, create a VY advancement so there's a nice hanging scrotum. We can dissect out little intricate arteries along the labia minora, bring them together in the midline, advancing the urethra from the native female meatus to the pubic bone. We're gonna cut the flap, make it ischemic so it doesn't have blood flow, bring it down to where the phallus should reside and get under an operating microscope. And so with suture that you can only see unless you're under the microscope, and so little nerves, arteries, and veins together, creating a phallus. And in my team's hands, yeah, we can do that. In my team's hands, we've done more than a thousand of these and that surgery would take about six to eight hours. But if you go to other centers in the world, they take 15 to 20 hours. I'm not saying we're better than them. I'll let you come to that conclusion on your own. So those are the options Dr. Civil Rights gives. One, educate society. Two, perform the most complicated urogenital reconstruction that's ever been created. And as it turns out, the easier thing to do is the most complicated urogenital reconstruction that's ever been created. So why is that? Why is that the easier path? How do we get here? especially when we live in a world where differences between humans are ubiquitous and readily observable. It's not controversial. We know that there's different ethnicities and that people on this planet have vastly different experiences. We know that some people are tall and some people are short. There's brown eyed people and blue eyed people. Some people are right handed and some people are left. We know that some people are geniuses and some people specifically are not. 
We know that some people are born with incredible athletic prowess and some people are gonna be really good at math and chess. We even subconsciously readily accept other examples of mind-body dualism. Being transgender is a mind-body dualism. One that I would bet almost everyone in here accepts is that the mind has to have a brain to exist. Yet the mind is a non-physical entity and the brain is a physical entity. So in our society, we believe that a non-physical entity needs a physical entity to exist. That is a paradox that we accept. The human belief system is riddled with paradoxes and deviations from the norm, from the smallest subatomic particle to macrophysics and astrophysics. For those of you out there that are quantum mechanics buffs, we believe that there are quantum systems that exist in overlapping states. In the case of the superposition principle, some of those overlapping states directly contradict each other. When it comes to astrophysics, we believe in the Fermi paradox that despite the lack of clear, obvious evidence of extraterrestrial life, there's a very high probability that there's life on other planets. Now, Sagan's paradox would say it's probably not intelligent life because intelligent life tends to annihilate itself. And that doesn't bode well for us humans. In space, no one can hear your civilization destroy itself. Regardless, the human belief system is riddled with all these paradoxes and in our time of his existence, we can accept so many variabilities, possibilities and exceptions to the norm. But when it comes to the realization that someone that appears female is actually male and vice versa, or that some exist on a continuum between male and female, that is a line drawn in the sand that some that readily accept all the other variabilities and paradoxes I just described will not believe in. Why are some of our elected officials against this community believing that their suffrage doesn't exist, that this is a choice or a cry for attention or attempt for a trans woman to just be really good at sports at the cost of isolation, ridicule and torment? The answer to these questions is I don't know. I'm sure the answer is multifactorial. Maybe some just aren't happy in their own lives. Maybe some are empowered by oppressing minorities. Maybe some are just really mean, but it's too simple to just write people off as ultra conservative, mean spirited oppressors. And worse yet, it's not productive for us to do that. Negotiation 101 is understanding the other side's belief system. Now, when I say understanding, I'm not saying agree with them. I'm not saying compromise, but an understanding of the other side's belief system can help us in our struggle for equality. So I think it's an important question to ask ourselves. And I was pondering this question once years ago when I realized that Although I have always accepted all of those around me, at one time, I made the same erroneous assumptions that I believe some of some people out there that are misguided about the trans community are also making. I wanna briefly share my experience with you that was a pivotal moment for myself where I corrected a misguided assumption that I had about the trans community. This was a time in my life that I had no idea how wrong I was about this community that I was about to spend the rest of my career in medicine helping. And it wasn't until I asked the right naive question to one very important patient whom I will never forget. It was only after taking this first step was I then able to become a world renowned healthcare provider in this field that I was at one time so profoundly uneducated upon. This is a story of one of the first trans patients I ever had the honor of caring for. It was in 2003 in Belgrade, Serbia. At the time, I was a urology resident at Dartmouth. I was allowed to go to Belgrade, Serbia and spend a few weeks operating. Now, while I was there, and this was a surprise to me, about 15 of the patients we took care of were Americans that were transgender, whose best option for healthcare was to go to Belgrade, Serbia. And I'd like you to keep in mind, just four years before, Belgrade, Serbia had been bombed for the third time in four years. 
excuse me, for the third time in the last century. The first was World War I, the second was World War II, and the third was during Milosevic's genocide against the Albanians. So these Americans' best option for health care was to go to a town ravaged by bombs four years before and was the epicenter of a genocide. That's where transgender Americans needed to go for health care. I'd like you to think about that later tonight. So I was there and I was operating and the hospital was really hot. So we kept the windows open, but there were no screens on the windows. And I distinctly remember a butterfly flying through the window and gracefully landing next to the sterile drapes adjacent to the wound I was operating in. And I remember thinking there must be some kind of symbolism here and that this beautiful creature that had transformed from caterpillar to butterfly was gracing us with its presence in the middle of this patient surgery, helping him surgically transition from female to male. And although poetic, I just wish the butterfly had waited a few hours to grace itself with its presence because I knew it hadn't scrubbed appropriately to be that close to the wound. So we, we politely ushered the butterfly out and continued operating. We were operating on this patient named David that I'm getting ready to introduce you to. We finished the surgery and remarkably, he didn't get an infection. During David's few weeks, I became very close with him. And I remember going to his room and chatting for anywhere from a half hour to three hours almost every night. And David and I talked about the differences between the Serbian and the American healthcare system. We talked about sports and music. We also talked about David's medical past. David had had his first gender confirmation surgery 30 years before. And I had never at that point met a patient that had gone through so much turmoil to achieve the anatomy David was meant to born with. And I still haven't. The surgeries had come a long way in 30 years. And in 30 years, David had had more than 20 surgeries. David had many complications and then his complications had complications. This lets David with scars all over both legs, both forearms, all over his abdomen. And unfortunately, the finish line for David's genitalia was a small fleshy mass with no urethra, no sensation, and was scarred, contracted, and only recognizable as a, an attempt at a phallic reconstruction because of where it happened to reside on his body. So while we were there, as I mentioned, I became very close with David, and towards the end of his stay, I asked him if I could ask some personal questions. He obliged, and so I asked what his orientation was. David said he was attracted to women. I asked him if he had a wife or a girlfriend, and he motioned toward his scarred body and phallic reconstruction and said, no, with a body like this and all these scars, he would never feel comfortable taking his clothes off in front of a woman and that he hadn't been intimate with anyone in 15 years. David was being very vulnerable with me. And it was at that point, it was at that moment that I chose to ask the world's stupidest question that a cis person could ever ask a trans patient. And I was so naive and my question was so rude. And in my moment of weakness and stupidity, I will never forget how kind, compassionate and patient David was with me. My question to David was, after all these surgeries and all the money you've spent and you can't have sex with someone, was all this worth it? David took my hand in his and he looked me in the eye and he said, Curtis, this is not about trying to have sex with someone. This is about going to the grocery store and not feeling like you're lying to society. And that's what being trans is for some in the community. We are living in a judgmental society. And when the image of yourself doesn't correspond with the image society has of you, it can cause daily conflict and insurmountable suffering. The trans community is fighting for the right to go to the grocery store, the bus stop, the library, the museum, and not feel judged.
This is the society we have created for the transgender community. And I think the same mistake I made that day, assuming that maybe the surgeries weren't worthwhile just because David couldn't have sex, is also a problem some of our politicians have with the trans community. They think this is about sex. A politician would never suggest to a general surgeon the best way to take a gallbladder out if a patient happened to be less than 18. Yet when it comes to treating an adolescent transgender patient, they feel well within their right to tell me who I can and can operate on. Because they think we're talking about sex and we don't like to think about sex in adolescence. We aren't supposed to, but we aren't asking them to. We're asking them to think about gender and anatomy that typically coexists with said gender but does not determine gender because your gender identity is in your mind, which by the way, may or may not need a brain to exist. Regardless, none of this has anything to do with the act of sex. And some people that go there, they can't think about deviations from what we consider normal sex. And we can't possibly separate sexual anatomy from the act of, the act of sex itself. We can't view genitalia the same way we view that people have oboes or that ears are really common and people get two of them. Genitalia holds guilt and shame because it's linked to an act that carries a heavy emotional burden on society, sex, which is even more bizarre when you consider most of us are here because of successful copulation involving genitalia. For those of you that are here as successful products of artificial insemination, I applaud your efforts in having much cleaner origins than the rest of us unwashed masses. So where do we go from here? Our only option is to humanize this predicament. Listen to the stories that brought us here. Understand the suffering. Find the empathy in yourselves to move past the worldview that's been ingrained in you because of politics or religion and just see a fellow human suffering. Don't try to find an ulterior motive or agenda for said suffering. Maybe the suffering is just pain that needs to be acknowledged and not an attempt to achieve a societal advantage over you. Lastly, I'll leave you with this. Those of us that are cis are wearing an invisible crown of acceptance on our heads that only the trans can see. And we take it for granted the first step that all of us need to take is acknowledging our crown and then create a crown for those that don't have one. That's what equality means to me. Everyone gets a crown. Thank you.